How's it going, y'all? Uh, it's been a couple of episodes since I've done this. We haven't had uh, any major tournament series. and uh, This has probably been the most excited I've been for a new tournament series. Not necessarily because I love the format. I'll talk about that a bit as we get there. Mostly just because I've been really, really grinding and playtesting and trying to find ways of handling it. Cause I think it's a very interesting format, even if it's a very strange one. Um, so this is prior to the Florida Materia Cup. Um, quick disclaimer, these are my opinions. I don't know everything. They're, this game is generally pretty well balanced. They're, because the community is relatively small, it's not unlikely that there are undiscovered strategies that are very, very good and underdeveloped and with the right pilot. It's not impossible that they're impossible that things would do very well that I'm not thinking of. Um, off the top of my head, I know there's like a weird mono lightning, like the lightning character, not like the color, that's doing very well right now. I don't have it on the tier list just because I haven't play tested or seen it enough to know. But it's one of those things that's like is so out of nowhere that I can't really place it right. And I think that that's kind of. It's very possible that there are five decks like that that I have no idea, but I do think I am not that far off the mark. Um, I'll put it that way. Um, so, real quick, we're going to go over what the different tiers are. Um, it's a little different from what a standard like tier list is. This isn't going to be based on numbers. These are just my opinions on where these decks place. So, any deck that I put in tier 1 they're obviously going to be in top cut or winning events. They're the decks to beat, and they're the decks that you should be preparing for. Um, I don't think every deck that's in tier one is always going to be the like the deck that's going to win the event, but I think it's going to be a, one of the highest represented decks in one of the most prepared for decks, for example. Uh, tier two, I think, is less common than the above. Might need a bit of a favorable bracket or some unknown innovations, but it's very capable of winning events, especially with the right pilots. Um, tier 3, uh, I would expect maybe one or two Tier 3 decks to get into Top Cut. Um, I don't think it's very likely for a Tier 3 deck to win an event. I think it's a little bit trickier to actually happen. Um, it's not impossible. Um, I would argue that probably the Fire Ice Aggro list that won the Florida re-raise last year was maybe actually Tier 3. And then it ran hot during the finals day. But I don't think it's likely to actually do that. Um, Rogue... These are decks that have pretty severe flaws, um, but I don't think it's likely they actually make top cut. Um, I do think a lot of these decks can cause upsets in Swiss rounds and cause some of these top tier decks to lose. They might have favorable matchups against a tier one deck randomly, but they have severe enough issues and problems that I just I don't see them making top cut, regardless of some of the inherent strengths the decks might actually have. And then there's everything else. Um, these are just fun decks that have, you know, one or two more good cards and to push them into playability. Knowledge of what they do can be nice. It's nice to not get caught off guard by these decks, but generally speaking, if you're doing well at a tournament, you shouldn't see these outside of the first two rounds of an event. Without further ado, screenshot this, put it on the wall, make fun of me in a, in a week. Uh, this is what I think the current metagame looks like. Um... I think that the best deck in the game right now is Fire Lightning 13, followed by Soiree with Warrior of Light, a Yuffie Cast deck, Mono Water, and Ice Earth. Um, there's a bit of nuance to this. I don't think these are directly comparable, and I think there are actually some very weird nuances to these lists. I'll go over each of these individually as I kind of go through Tier 1 and what those decks mean. Uh, tier 2, uh, Fire Ice 13, Cast, uh, all the other cast decks, Ice Lightning, Earth Lightning, Avalanche, and Earth Water. Uh, tier 3, Ninjas, Earthwind, Midrange, Dragoons, Warriors of Light, Fire Ice, FF6, Black Mages, Sky Pirates, Guardians, Megissa, Mono Fire, Twins, FF12, Good Stuff, and Fire Wind. And then Rogue Decks, Monks, Scions, Bart Spoko, Dancers, Knights, Turks, Radia Turbo, and Golbez. Again, I have little details and slides for every one of these decks. If you're curious about what they are and what they do, we'll kind of talk about the whole metagame. Uh, bit by bit. Um, it's a very strange format. Again, there's a lot of decks here, but there's kind of two boogeymen in the format that make it very difficult to both deck building and evaluate. So the biggest one is Fire Lightning 13. To me right now, you're either playing Fire Lightning 13, you're playing to beat Fire Lightning 13, or you are losing to Fire Lightning 13. 
Um, there is almost no in-between. I think the reason Soiree with Warrior of Light jumped so high is because it's one of the very few decks that has a very decent Fire Lightning 13 matchup, along with the ability to handle the cast decks. Second boogeyman of the format is the number of cast decks. Um, there are so many win decks in the game right now that if they get to a late game against any non-win deck, they just automatically win. You could just pencil them in, game over, win wins. And this can happen as soon as turn four or five. Um, however, you notice they're in tier two, and the reason why is because they cannot beat Fire Lightning 13 without severely compromising their engine. Um, it is very difficult for them to stabilize against Fire Lightning 13, with a couple of exceptions. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, Mono Water as well has a chance against Fire Lightning 13, as does Ice Earth. They're just able to tech cards that have a chance against it, allow them to survive and have good matchups against the rest of the field. And then we'll get into kind of tier 2 as we get there. Alright, so here we go. Tier 1. Fire Lightning 13. This is, I think, undisputedly the deck that you are pre preparing to beat the most right now. It's the most represented deck at top tables. It is unequivocally one of the hardest decks to prepare for in the game's history. Uh, why is that? Um, it really boils down to this trio of cards. Um, this deck could play probably about 15 characters, and the rest of it could just be random purple and red cards, and it would still probably be a top-tier deck. Um, what it boils down to is the interactions between Hope and Vanille. So Hope and Vanille have the ability to search each other and then search out Lightning as the cherry on top. So if this deck goes first, you play one of the two with C, search the other with C, and search a Lightning. Um, you have two very large forwards on field and a lightning in hand. If your opponent doesn't respond to the Hope Vanille, you slam the lightning, swing, deal four points of damage, and your opponent is threatened with lethal next turn while you have four cards in hand. Um, if anybody remembers Sophie Doga, it's a very similar playstyle. Um, instead of Sildra, you have Hope and Vanille, and instead of Sophie, you have lightning. Um, and there's not a lot of weaknesses in the list. Because it's in fire, it has access to Amaterasu. If you don't handle the Hope and Vanille as they come in, they can draw five cards and get to the Amaterasu, which gives the board protection, at which point you're going to lose if you try to Shantoto it away, and you've taken four damage. Um, the printing of Ishtola was extremely valuable for the deck, as it now has a late game win condition. Uh, if, you, if the deck pushes you to damage six, which it does very easily, Ishtola can just close out a game that would be otherwise very difficult to end. Um, and I think this is one of the most frustrating decks, uh, period. Um, it's capable of killing turn two. I will straight up tell you. I know that, like, if you're like, oh, it kills a turn two, that is not the problem with the deck. I think the only way this deck consistently loses is if it goes for the turn two kill. Um, outside of specific matchups where it knows it has to go for it. But in general, if you just do the Hope Vanille pass, it's going to cost so much more to remove the Hope and Vanille than it costs to play those cards that the deck is still favored until it's not, essentially. Um, it is probably the single strongest aggro deck since Stern Chocobos. Um, which should tell you a lot. I think Stern Chocobos, having played against a friend playing that recently, despite the fact I was on a very powerful deck, that deck would still be top tier today. So uh, take that as you will. Um, the deck that I think is best positioned to handle 13 is Soiree with Warrior of Light. Um, you'll remember Soiree from the last tier list video, and it kind of fell off the, the radar a little bit. I don't know if that was necessarily the deck got worse. I know some people will argue, oh, Soiree's not good, Soiree's not good. I don't, I think this, the Final Fantasy TCG as a whole has a small issue with uh, Flavor of the Month. Um, whatever the new best deck is tends to have the most pilots, even though Soiree really didn't lose anything. There was no direct nerf to Soiree. Soiree still did Soiree things. There were just other decks that people wanted to play. But Soiree was always good, and I think the thing that Soiree has access to over everything else is Soiree always liked Cecil. Didn't always play Cecil, but it was always a card that it liked having access to. And Cecil, Warrior of Light, is essentially an FTK versus... Uh, 13. It is so difficult for 13 to handle Cecil Warrior of Light. Um, to the point where I think most 
any deck that can run Cecil Warrior of Light probably has to. Um, they just they can't get over a 10k first strike brave, and the the uh, Cecil adding some protection to the board makes it even more difficult. Um, I would not be surprised to see that eventually change and that the deck adapt in ways to handle this, but this is currently the most consistent way of turn one going. They go Hope Vanille, you go Cecil, Warrior of Light, and the game is probably decided at that point. Um, it gives you time to stabilize, at which point you're going to actually outvalue them over the course of the game. Um, winner of the most recent Japanese event is a Yuffie Cast deck. Um, Wind decks have been the best deck in the format since about the printing of Luso. And it's not really much of a surprise. Wind is just such a pushed color that if it gets to late game, it beats everything. Um, so the question is just getting to late game, especially because when this deck wants to get to five, four or five backups before it does anything, that means that the 13 stuff poses a massive problem. Um, in comes Yuffie. Yuffie is a card that 13 struggles to deal with. Um, it's a 10k untargetable brave forward, essentially. That also represents a board wipe. Um, I think you have to play in a very weird way with Yuffie. Um, because you can't always get the attack trigger off. Um, I think the most common thing you'll do is play the Yuffie attack on your first turn in response to the board which buys you a turn, and then the next turn you have to Doom of the Living before you go to combat, just because if you don't, and you get Bahamuted or Amaterasu'd on your attack, you probably lose that game. But Yuffie gives the deck a chance against 13 while still having the win late game. So I think this is the best version of win right now, and it's the one that I would expect to win the most tournaments. Um, of note, I think 13 is going to struggle to win tournaments because there's, people are packing so much hate for it, but I think probably two or four slots in top cut will be 13. Um, and I think Yuffie Cast is a deck that tries to make wins about 1-9 matchup against 13 into about a 50-50. Which is about as good as you could hope for considering Yuffie's about a 6 or 7 card engine overall. Uh, Mono Water was the best mid-range deck of last format. That is still true. Um... It has a massive weakness to Wind, but Wind is getting pushed out of the format thanks to its inability to handle 13. Therefore, Mono Water is going to remain probably a top tier deck. Um, Sildra is still maybe the best summon individually in the game. Lena Leviathan is still extremely crazy, it's extremely powerful, and um, you can run enough powerful EX bursts. Hitting a Levi Leviathan 6 on the first point of damage from 13 is essentially the game end of the game. Um, however, I think this deck is going to struggle if it ever hits a wind deck. So you have to kind of gamble a bit that wind is not going to show up because the Mono Water's game plan against wind does not function in the same way that Soiree can handle wind. Um, Ice Earth, uh, I think this is the premier control deck of the format. Um, it can run uh, most of the best answers to 13 while also being able to have a very powerful late game. I think Weiss is one of the most innocuous cards ever printed. I don't think anybody thought this card would be as powerful as it eventually became. Um, so the combination of Weiss, Scale Toad, Prish, Biblos, Unaleska, it just becomes so difficult to handle this deck in late game, except for exactly win decks they can kind of make this a moot matchup. And that's it for Tier 1. Uh, so Tier 2, um, Fire Ice 13, I think is a little bit slept on. I wouldn't expect to see this as much, but I think it has a decent matchup into 13 itself, um, while having kind of different strengths and weaknesses. Um, it is a lot more weak to Ixion, but Orphan is a surprisingly powerful card to play for 3 CP. Um, which Fang can help you do. Um, I think Sarah Mog 13 is extremely slept on as a combination, and Snow is a better version of Hope for all intents and purposes. So um, it's a little bit more awkward to play. It's 
got some weird matchup differences, but it does a lot of the same things that Fire Lightning 13 does, just less consistently. All of the wind cast decks are right here, um, and the only reason they are here and not at the top of tier 1 is because they cannot beat 13 consistently. Um, Ice Wind is extremely powerful, but you have to chain 3 casts every single turn from turn 2 until the point at which you have won the game, um, while also potentially dealing with Amaterasu's. It is extremely difficult to do. Um, you have to almost... The only times I've seen Icewind beat 13 is when Icewind goes first and the 13 player does not draw Hope or Vanille. If either of those things is true, then the Icewind player can't beat 13. Um, I will say if you're willing to gamble that you won't face 13 more than twice over the course of Swiss, Icewind has incredible matchups against everything else in Top Cut. Um, it is faster than the Mono Wind list. It is um, more robust at handling... Uh, Ice Wind, Mono Wind absolutely struggles against it um, until unless they get a Yag Rosh down, and even then it's still very difficult to handle. And uh, yeah, it's just it cannot beat uh, Fire Lightning 13 to save its life. Uh, FF10 cast focus decks are very powerful as well, but the reliance on Riku to get Barlai and Yuna onto the field means that they're going to struggle against 13. Um, again, it's one of those things where it's like, if you go Brother, but don't play the Riku that turn, the, then you can't use a Yuna unless you have one in hand, which means you can't remove a forward, at which point you've lost that game. But going Brother Riku on the first turn is very risky as well, just given how well your hand size goes. It's very hard to protect cards in your hand at that point if, you're, if they have any alternative game plans. It's just a little tricky. Um, and then you have Wind Lightning 13, which is... Of the, the Windex, it's the worst against other Windex, but it's the most defensive. So outside of Yuffie, it has the best chance against 13. Um, it's also a little bit strange, because there's not a lot of reason to be playing Lightning in a cast deck outside of exactly Cloud. So you kind of have to like fudge the numbers a little bit and get stuff like uh, Golbez, Man in Black, Hooded Man is good in there... Um, but in general, it's one of the few decks that has a chance against 13, just given uh, Lightning Summons tend to be very good against 13. Um, Ixian is known to be the best card, one of the best cards against them. I don't think it's as good as people think it is. I would rather run Hecaton Cheer, but I can't deny that Ixian does well against 13. Um, Ice Lightning. Um, this was one of the best aggro decks of the last format. It's still very good at aggro. It has a very strong mid-range game plan. Um, it's able to run a lot of the lightning summons that'll give it a chance against 13. Dulling and freezing 13's forwards is still very powerful. Um, something like an Alcid into Xeramis to kind of lock down. Um, two of the forwards means their damage potential is severely capped next turn. Um, Sephiroth is still extremely powerful. Um, lightning is very good as well. Um, it can run Ixian because it, it doesn't tend to run a lot of two-cost forwards. Um, however, it is a deck that always feels a little bit awkward to play. I don't really know how better to put it. Um, it feels like last set it was like on the cusp of Tier 1, but not quite there, or like the very bottom of Tier 1. Um, but it is definitely a good deck. I don't think there's any denying that. Um, Earth Lightning, um, this is kind of another mid-range control deck. Basically it was Mono Water before Mono Water took off last set. Um, Vanille is an extremely powerful card. Man in Black is great. X-Death is great. Um, it's able to run the Hecaton Cheer and the Chantoto that, that Fire Lightning 13 is going to struggle with. But again, it also is going to struggle with... Uh, its. I think it had a pretty bad matchup against Mono Water last set, and it's never had a good matchup against Mono Wind. Um, outside of things like slamming Vanille turn one, which is very difficult to do. You have to kind of know what your opponent's on. Um, but, I mean, X-Death and Man in Black are some of the best late game payoffs basically ever printed, so it definitely has a chance. Um, Avalanche. Uh, Avalanche has lost a little bit of shine, finally. Main reason just being that 13 has overtaken it as the premier aggro deck. 
but Avalanche kind of operates on a different axis from 13, so I think a lot of the decks that are prepared for 13 won't be able to handle Avalanche nearly as well. Um, Barret dodges so much removal that 13 has trouble with, and then Biggs and Wedge are um, so recursive and so powerful that they actually have a chance, even in the bad matchups. Uh, lastly, we have Earth Water. Um, Une and Garnet are, in my opinion, the best multi-element cards printed last set. Um, it's more so a matter of figuring out what shell to play them in, which I don't know, admittedly. Um, I've seen a Summoner's List do okay. Um, biggest issue with that deck being lack of other forwards. Um, usually it was on about 15 to 20, which meant that both in Mirrors or against other Earth decks, it tended to really struggle to push damage. Um, I really like, uh, there was a turning tourney winning list that was earth water rainbow like the, the main shell was earth and water but it ran like fusoia and warrior of light um to kind of give it some really good late game teeth and that deck is very strong having played against it now um i think this is a list that very easily could go up to tier one especially if uh the 13 stuff starts to fall off a little bit i think the biggest problem with it is that une isn't particularly good against 13. Um, she's not big enough as a body, and bouncing one forward doesn't do very much, and they're very rarely going to play backups that matter. Um, they will happily take a Reeve back to hand, so... I think it's a very powerful deck that's just very poorly positioned against the current metagame. Um, tier 3, Ninjas. Um, ninjas kind of really spiked around Opus 17, early Opus 18, thanks to Yugiri making it so much more consistent, so much more powerful. Uh, essentially, you play like a Mono Wind Category 4 shell, running a couple of Yugiris to help um, get Edge out. Um, it has something very unique for any deck, which is consistent and powerful backup destruction. Um, it's very hard to break low-cost backups, and Ninjas are one of the only decks that can do it on curve, essentially. Um, it makes better use of a lot of the Category 4 tools like uh, Seador, the Light Cecil, and such that kind of didn't have a home but were very powerful cards regardless. Uh, it is a wind deck though that will struggle with 13. Um, Edge is good, but Edge does 3k per shuriken counter. It's very hard to get into the number of counters you need to, to handle a lightning before um, things really go crazy. Um, Earthwind Midrange, I'm going to put in Tier 3. This is a, kind of a personal favorite deck. I absolutely adore the Noctis Retainer Package. Um, I think Earthwind as a deck is actually decently well positioned into 13, given that I think Gladiolus is the second best answer to a 13 board, other than exactly Warrior of Light. The difficulty is that... Earthwind struggles very heavily into other wind decks. Um, it tends to be a lot slower than other wind decks with a weaker late game. But Noctis Gladio, or like Noctis is one of the best removal engines in the game. Gladio and Prompto are extremely powerful. Um, things like Wall and Sophie are still very good. Uh, you can run Cecil in this, which means you can run Warrior of Light. Cecil Warrior of Light is as good as it has ever been. Things like uh, Star Sybil can also help you get your Warrior of Lights into play earlier and often. I think there is a place for this deck. I don't know if that place is in the top cut of a tournament. But I do think it's a deck that has more potential than people realize. So I'm going to put it in Tier 3. Uh, Dragoons, especially Mono Lightning Dragoons. I think the printing of Ricard is maybe one of the best things that could have happened for this deck, um, especially with when you factor in Kane. Um, funnily enough, for a Dragoon deck, there wasn't a really a version of Kane the deck wanted to play. You would see them sometimes go into Wind, running like uh, as few as six Wind cards, just trying to get a uh, Kane onto the field with haste, thanks to Barbara. And it never really felt great, so you can kind of just cut that whole package and run Mono Lightning Dragoons. And Ricard, I think, if Ricard was any color other than purple, Ricard's Full Arts would actually be decently valuable as just one of the best backup engines in the game. Um, just filters towards your next Lightning card. If you open your first hand and you don't see Alice, but you see Ricard, you don't mulligan that hand because Ricard essentially mulligans for you. 
Um, and then Freya is... Cherry Blossom is one of those effects that has never gotten worse. Um, it is, It has been powerful since the card was printed and the Critical Mass of Dragoons reached, there, reached the game, and it's only gotten better over time. Um, the only real knock against Freya is that she's a 3-cost 5k, but that doesn't matter when Cherry Blossom is maybe the best, one of the best specials in the game. Warriors of Light, this is one I might be wrong on. I'm going to put this in Tier 3. It did hit top cut in the most recent uh, Japanese tournament. Um, there are a lot of people saying that this deck is very real. I don't know. I will be totally honest. I still read Warriors of Light as the same deck it's always been, which is a deck that needs to hit a critical mass of names to be good, but those names are multiplayable. And if you can play four forwards in any deck, you're probably going to win that game anyway. So I don't know how much stock I really put in what this deck brings. Uh, Refia is a good card that doesn't have... There's just not enough Warrior of Light backups, and I don't like this effect on a forward in the same way. Like, if there was just, like, a, you know, a bunch of Warrior of Light water backups, you could consider this card a lot better than she is. Because, like, as it is, even if you play her off of, like, three Warrior of Light backups... And they go to combat, she's a free cast, but she doesn't get the draw because it's very hard to dull her before you go to combat. If you pay for her otherwise and like have three backups and then spend something, then they'll reactivate, which draws you the card. But then you're kind of not using your backups for anything other than removal, which like it's a good removal spell, but you start to kind of see the issues with Refia there. Um, Ferris, every time I've played this card, I've never been more disappointed by a legend than I thought it was going to be um, powerful than this one. I thought this card was extremely good when I first read it last set. And she never lined up for me uh, to be powerful. Bart's is one of those cards that, like, on paper should be really good, but it forces you to run crystals, and crystals are just kind of awkward to play in general. It, it's it's so difficult and so close to put a uh, marker on where this deck actually fits. Um, Fire Ice FF6, I think, is one of the... It's a very interesting deck. Um, this one might be closer to, like, uh, Rogue than it is to Tier 3, but I've seen enough results from FF6 where I, I'm, I'm never willing to discount this deck entirely. Um, Edgar, Sabin, um, I think Mog 6 actually is a very large buff for the deck, given that there's actually enough decent FF6 backups, unlike Warriors of Light, to where I feel comfortable saying you can get Mog 6 consistently into play for free, um. Edgar getting back a Sabin in a Mog 6 is uh, very, very strong when you have three backups. You can just free cast the Mog 6. Um, tap a backup, play the Sabin. All of a sudden, now you've got a removal spell on, a removal engine online, along with uh, Chakra is shockingly powerful. It's just a good deck um, with a couple of weird oddities to it. I think it's very difficult to pilot. But I also think it's difficult to play against, um, and I, I do think that that helps it a lot. Uh, Black Mages, um, I'm going to put in Tier 3. There's a lot of different builds for this. Um, Lightning Water is a common one. Lightning Fire is good. Earth Lightning is good. Um, the main benefit of this is that it has a decent chance against 13, given that Black Waltz 3 is able to cheaply and efficiently remove uh, all of the 13 forwards that matter. Um, not too much more to say, that it hasn't changed with the new set, but it still does what it does. Um, Sky Pirates! Uh, so Sky Pirates are still a little bit slow, they're still a control deck, they're still going to lose to 13, but they still have a very strong late game. I'm not comfortable not putting this in Tier 3, because I do think there's a chance that this does get into a top cut here and there, if a suitably good pilot wants to play it. Um, still does exactly what it used to do, builds a board that is incredibly difficult to interact with, and builds Exodia, at which point it draws its entire deck with Pinello and wins the game. Not too much more to say than that. Um, I think Guardians got a lot of support this set. The new Yuna, the new Riku. Um, these are not cards that had good name clash prior to this set. Um, Riku enables uh, Ject to run the Fire Ject, which is a very powerful EX burst that the deck wanted to play but couldn't play just given the uh, inability to play fire cards in the deck. Now it can do that no problem, thanks to Riku. Um, I've even seen that card cast and do well now. Like, you'll cast it, kill something, 
crack it, search a Tidus, Tidus then gets you the correct eject out of the deck. Um, which ends up actually being quite good. Um, and then Waka still is just a very solid card, as it turns out. Magissa, uh, I know uh, most people that think this probably should be in Tier 2. I'm not really convinced. I think this is going to struggle with a lot of the same hate that um, 13 has. Um, if you go like a Magissa board and your opponent Hecaton shears you, you've gone so down far in hand size. And unlike 13, this deck doesn't have the consistency that that deck has in uh, rebuilding. So for now, I'm going to put it in uh, Tier 3. I just see it as another one of those aggro decks that's worse than 13. So I feel like the 13 decks are going to just kind of outclass it. And because the 13 decks exist, I think there's going to be enough hate for Megissa that I don't see it um, winning events. But I would love to be proven wrong. Twins. Oh, how far the mighty have fallen. Um, I genuinely believe last set that the Mono Water Twins list I played was the best deck in the game um, prior to the 13 deck being printed. And almost overnight, people started running so much hate for that deck that the twin stuff is very difficult to play. It's very hard to stick Pal and Porum nowadays. And they don't get big quickly enough to handle the 13 deck. Um, so I think in, in general, it's just kind of the worst version of Mono Water to play the Mono Water Twins list that I had. There's maybe a version of this list that still does it, but I think for now, until uh, something changes with the 13 stuff, I think the Twins list is going to be a little bit difficult to actually see its way into any top cuts. But I genuinely think that my Mono Water Twins list last set, until the 13 starter that came out, was the best deck in the game. Um, FF12, good stuff. Um, this is essentially Fran control. Um, Fran actually has a lot of very powerful targets. Um, it has the ability to go the four colors for Warrior of Light. Because you're in Wind, you can play Cecil. Anything that can do Cecil Warrior of Light is decent enough right now to be considered. Um, I For the first time, I finally actually played with the Headhunter package, and it's shockingly competent. Um, I did not realize that, especially when Fran is playing them for free every single turn. Uh, I think this is a deck that has a chance. I just don't know who would actually want to pilot it is the main question. But I think with a good pilot, this deck actually is very good and it's going to catch people off guard. Uh, and lastly, Firewind. Um, Zidane is maybe one of the most broken cards without a home in the game right now. Um, he's kind of taken that mantle away from the Opus 15 Terra Legend. Uh, like, I don't think there's too much more to say. Uh, you just get to rip your opponent's answers to everything in your hand or everything that you're doing. I think that, like, the scariest possibility to me is the idea that 13 starts running this Zidane, which I expect them to start doing just because there's so few viable answers to 13 that Zidane actually starts being a good idea because if it takes an extra turn to kill, but the opponent can't answer the 13 board, the 13 board is going to win. Um, I don't know what this shell looks like, I'll be totally honest. Firewind is such a strange deck to try to make work. There's probably something there that works. Broska is a cheap removal engine that gives them a chance against 13. Zidane gives them a chance against Wind and other control decks. I just don't know what this deck looks like. Um, and I, I would need someone to show me what it does before I put it higher than tier 3. Everything else. Um, monks. Uh, monks are a deck that has fallen on hard times, mostly given that the deck is a little bit too slow and too fair. Um, Ursula is still a very good card. Yang is still a good card. Sophie's still a good card. They're just cards that haven't had support recently enough to really push this into the next uh, like grouping of decks. There have been new monks printed and none of them have changed the math on how the deck plays to a degree that I'm comfortable actually making this deck any higher than this. Um, Scions. Scions still have a lot of the same issues. They still do a lot of the things that control decks do, but they need specific damage thresholds. Or, or, or Oracle of Light still is a card that is hard to proc effectively. Um, it's gotten easier this set thanks to Chimera. Um, Thancred Ishtola is very powerful, but again needs three water backups to work. Or two water backups, I suppose. Um, it's just a little bit awkward um, to actually line up. It might have a decent 13 matchup given Ishtola's ability to give large forwards haste for a strike. Um... We will see, though.
Um, Bart's Boko, this is a bit of a stompy deck. Um, again, it, it's just kind of worse Avalanche for the most part, but it does tend to sneak, sneak into a top cut every now and then, just given how fast the deck goes and how when it goes off, it really goes off. Um, I've seen this deck do 5 damage on turn 1 before, just for funsies. Um, it wasn't necessarily the best thing it could be doing, but it was very obnoxious when it happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it does the same thing it's done since Opus 12. Uh, one drop forwards keep getting printed that are all good. It's just a little too fragile at this point. Um, any removal on the Boko or the Barts uh, shuts the entire deck off, and everybody's packing some speed removal to handle 13 right now. Dancers! Dancers are one of the like have one of the best like random archetypal payoffs that can't play it. Um, Lyakov and Lilliset as a duo have been powerful since they're printed. They have yet to find a home. Um, the wind, the, the deck wants you to go water wind, but then you can't play Lilliset without cheating her into play with Mayakov or Cecil. Um, none of the wind dancers really change how the deck plays and to a degree that I feel comfortable recommending it. It is extremely close to being there. Like, genuinely maybe three good dancers away from being a, uh, a meta viable deck. It's just not there yet. Um, knights. Uh, knights I th have gone the opposite direction. Knights were a deck that I thought was very slept on and very powerful and they have not aged well. Um, Ramza getting back Gawain in two turns. Ramza is one of the few warp cards that I think actually was a hit. He just hit in a deck that is still missing enough pieces. Um, I would like to see some backups for this added. Um, Agrius is still good, but 7k is starting to lose its shine. This deck is getting there. It still has a ways to go, unfortunately. Um, hopefully we see some new knight support in the future to help kind of bring this back into relevance. Um, Turks. Turks are the other side of the Avalanche versus Shinra structure deck. Um, I still like Turks. I think Turks have still some untapped potential. Um, there's some cute stuff you can do with X-Death and Varialde in Lightning Wind. And that deck still needs a finisher. And I think the Turks are maybe the best engine as a finisher for that deck. Um, I think Bartz uh, is the best Turk, hilariously. Um, he gets to be ludicrously big once everything is on field. It's just a matter of getting him there. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's a very interesting deck. Um, I don't know that anybody solved it, and I don't know how many people are going to be piloting it at this level. That's the big thing, the big sticking points with Turks. Ridia Turbo, this is another one of how f uh, far the mighty have fallen, which kind of makes sense. Ridia Turbo was always good, but always very fragile, and its worst matchups are back to being top tier decks. Um, Ridia Turbo used to prey on wind decks that struggle to remove Ridia outside of exactly Typhon. As those wind decks start to fall out of favor, and other removal engines start coming in to deal with 13, um, Ridia Turbo starts to really struggle, um, which is, I think, still true to this day. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to put Golbez at the bottom of my everything else. Golbez has a shockingly good 13 matchup. Um, if, the, if the 13 player uh, does the thing where it windmill slams two forwards, if Golbez slams the Golbez, Golbez probably wins that game unless the opponent draws a Amaterasu or Bahamut. Um, it is still very all-in. It's still um, a little telegraphed. There's more non-destructive removal for Golbez than ever, but if you think your locals is entirely going to be 13, Golbez has a chance against that deck specifically, so it's maybe worth a look. And that's it. Um, this video is already way too long, so I will leave all of this information with you and uh, wish everybody that's playing in the big tournaments this weekend in the EU, in Florida, and in Australia good luck. And uh, I hope to see you all in Top Cut now that you know how the metagame looks.